Well, come on. Good afternoon or good evening or wherever you're watching us from around the world. If it's good morning, then good morning. But I want to thank you for joining us here today on this blackdoctor.org Facebook Live in partnership with our friends at Genentech as well as our always, always so gracious partners at Cedar sinai Hospital. Uh, this is part four of our six-part series talking about healthy brain. So we've been talking about Alzheimer's and dementia and everything in between on how to help our brains age successfully as we get older. So what I want you to do at the beginning of this, of this broadcast is to, number one, let us know you're, where you're watching from. Drop that in the comment section. We'd like to know where people are watching us from all over the world. So make sure you, you do that. Number two, if you have a question, drop that in the comments. But this show is all about your questions. But if you have some additional questions, Please drop those in the comments and we'll try to get those asked if, we, if time permits. And then finally, if you know somebody that needs this information, please tag them, share this on your page. We, I, we like to get this information out to as many people as possible. So this show is a special show and I, I'm really excited that we're going to do this version of the show. As you can see, we've got our expert, Dr. Tan. He is phenomenal. He, was, he did our first show for us and really shed some wonderful light on a, a healthy aging brain. But for this show, this is all about answering your questions. So on, on these past shows that we've done, we've had some of your questions that we couldn't get to. So we kind of went through the questions of the old programming, pulled out some good ones, and we said, this is a show about ask the experts. We're going to talk. We're going to ask those great questions that you dropped in those comment section and make sure that it gets out and get those questions answered for you. So I know you didn't sign on to hear me talk. So. Dr. Tan, how are you doing today? I'm doing well, Ellis. Thank you for having me back. It's a pleasure to be here. No, we, we love having you here, and, and it's fantastic that, that you're able to, to come back. And really, I, I really want to say thank you up front for, for doing this version of the show, because really answering people's questions, that's what we're all about, is getting those questions answered so they'll feel more comfortable uh, in, in these times. And just on a personal note, um, uh, my father, I'm going to get full disclosure, my father is in the hospital right now. Um, he had some, he's got some falling challenges, but one of the things that they did, and I noticed when I was in there with him, was they were asking him, because he's 75, they were asking him some questions. Do you know what month it is, Mr. Dean? Who is this person with you, Mr. Dean? So all of those questions, and I said, oh, I know what they're doing. They're testing his cognitive functioning, right? And so I was like, I learned that from Dr. Tan. And so I'm really going to be interested in some of these answers because, um, you know, we got to know what that threshold is, right? That is normal decline and where there is some some impairment that could be dementia and or, or, or Alzheimer's. So I, I'm going to be personally uh, attuned to some of these answers that you have for us today. So uh, if you're if you're ready to get started, let's uh, let's strap it in and get it going. I'm ready. And by the way, kudos to the hospital where your father is. Um, and I'm, support, uh, I'm sorry that he's in the hospital, but the fact that they actually did a cognitive screen it tells you that it's a good hospital. Uh, yes. They, they're concerned <laughs> about his cognition, not just his blood pressure, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> right. All right. So let's get started. I have a few uh, introductory slides just to frame the conversation. Because sometimes uh, brain health means different things for everyone. But uh, according to the World Health Organization, this is how they define brain health. Brain health is a state of brain functioning across these, um, these things, cognitive, sensory, social, emotional, behavioral, and motor domains that allows a person to realize their full potential. I pulled in bold full because however you want to live your life uh, defines what full potential is over the life course, irrespective of the presence of absence of disorders. So that's, a, I think, a, a mouthful, but I think the important thing to realize is that the brain is more than just memory. 
is in it. It's also attention and concentration, as you see here with cognitive. It's also planning and sequencing and other cognitive functions. It's also sensory, the ability to see things, hear things, um, taste and feel the world around us. It's also the social emotional aspect of, um, of our being, our mood, our friendships, our community, uh, behavioral, our, how do we interact with uh, in the environment and others in the environment. And finally, motor, what allows us to do the things that we love to do, whether it be walking, uh, cooking, or simple things like folding laundry, cutting vegetables. So this is what defines brain health, and this is really what we're hoping to accomplish with talks like this, is to promote, is to promote brain health as we get older. Um, and I also want to mention, Alice, to our viewers that cognitive aging is not the same as Alzheimer's disease. So I always, always feel like there's a confusion about, oh, I'm getting older, therefore I might be getting Alzheimer's disease. Just know that they're very different, right? We all get older, we all have gray hair, we all have wrinkles. That's part of uh, aging, what makes aging so beautiful. Uh, so cognitive aging is when, you know, some of the processes by which we remember things get a bit slower, but it doesn't mean that we're getting Alzheimer's disease, right? It only means that we just take a bit more time to recall that name of the restaurant that we went to uh, that weekend or the last movie we showed, we saw. So that's part of uh, cognitive aging and it's not, uh, it's not uh, abnormal and certainly not Alzheimer's disease. Uh, and when you look under the brain, someone who is normally cognitively aging, uh, the number of brain cells are the same, right? It's not like they're losing brain cells um, as they get older. Uh, it, occurs, it occurs for everyone, whether you are, uh, you know, uh, whether you're the president of the, of the United States or or not, you know, there everyone ages, and that's just uh, a fact. And uh, it's also very variable and gradual, and it's not severe or progressive like Alzheimer's disease. So I just want to set the stage to make sure that we're we're talking about the same things. Alzheimer's is a chronic neurodegenerative disease. It's progressive and um, it, it leads to uh, severe and progressive memory loss. So I want to talk a lot about um, what's good for the brain. In fact, um, you know, um, after these one or two slides, I'm going to go dive right into the questions that our viewers sent to us. But I want to also uh, show this slide uh, just to get this out of the way. So what is bad for the brain? We always talk about exercise and sleep and you know diet as good for the brain but what are the things that are bad for our brain right things that we should avoid or steer clear from well certain types of medications may not be good for our brain i'm talking about you know these sleep medications that we take even over the counter things like benadryl or our diphenhydramine the sedative hypnotics uh, benzodiazepines those are not the best for our brain. It's fine if you use them uh, sparingly, like you know, for jet lag or or something like that. But uh, certainly not chronically. Also, having many medications or duplicates of medications called polypharmacy uh, is not good for the brain. So it's always a good idea whenever you see your your primary care doctor to go over your medication list and ask them, um, Do I really need to be in all these medications, or are there things that we could get rid of? Maybe they're not working, or maybe they, you don't need them anymore. You need you need them once, but you don't need them anymore. So uh, make sure you go over your medications because some medications are not good for your brain. But certainly, don't stop don't stop any medications without talking to your doctor, right? But it's important to have that conversation. Uh, Ellis, you mentioned about your father being hospitalized. I'm sorry again, but hospitalizations tend to be not good for uh, older people. Uh, any acute medical illness, major surgery, especially if you, uh, the person has to go to intensive care unit, uh, that usually makes them a bit more confused. Uh, doesn't mean it's permanent, but for some people, they can lose some of, of their memory and cognition. So again, hospitals are there for a reason. They save our lives, they prolong our lives. But I tell my patients, if you do not have to be in the hospital, don't check into the hospital just for the sake of it because <laughs> hospitals are not hotels. They're not meant to uh, for rest. It's really meant for people who need them, who need to be there. Uh, having a serious infection, alcohol abuse certainly is not good for your brain. You'll lose brain cells because of alcohol. So uh, use it in moderation if you are a drinker. Uh, hearing loss and vision loss. Um, when you lose the stimulation of the world around us, you can lose memory as well. So it's important to make sure that if you have hearing loss, always wear your hearing aids. 
If you have vision loss, make sure you wear your eyeglasses. Uh, you don't want to deprive yourself of the simulation of the wonderful world around us. Uh, sleep is also an important thing. So if you have sleep apnea or other issues, make sure you talk to your doctors about that. Uh, having uh, vascular uh, and uh, risk factors such as high blood pressure, diabetes, which is a, you know in this slide on the right hand side, uh, can cause uh, memory problems. So make sure that's adequately treated. Uh, and having certain types of um, medical conditions like kidney disease, cancer, thyroid, that has to be adequately treated. Otherwise, it's not good for your brain. Depression. In this era of mental health, so many things are happening around us uh, that a lot of people are not in a, in a good mood and a good uh, mindset. It's important to make sure that uh, to recognize signs of depression and have that adequately treated because it's also not good for your brain. Um, head trauma. Always wear that helmet. Try not to fall, right? If you wear, if you um, if you drive, make sure you wear a seatbelt because you don't want to to have your brain be traumatized because that is an, a known risk factor for getting Alzheimer's disease later in life. And finally, genetics. We'll talk more about genetics. I think one of the questions or a couple of questions had have to deal with genetics, but certainly we can't choose our parents, right? But we could uh, certainly uh, try our best to to um, improve the rest of the things that are under our control. Um, and again, the, just the top three things, be physically active, stay physically active, uh, because exercise is good for your brain. These are the top three things you can do for your brain. Number two is reduce cardiovascular risk factors. So if you have high blood pressure, diabetes, you're a smoker, make sure you uh, get that adequately treated. And of course, stop smoking if you are, because those are not good for your brain. And then finally, uh, medications. So go over your medications with your doctor. Make sure that uh, the medications that you're on is not adversely affected, your, affecting your thinking and that there's no duplication or unnecessary medications in that medication list. So with that, Ellis, maybe we should dive into our audience questions. Yeah, so um, this was a great question and I thought this would really help people to kind of encapsulate that I see some questions that are coming in on our comments right now that are talking about what's the difference and, and how do you notice? And so what should someone say to their primary care physician? That's what PCP stands for, um, to let them know that they or a loved one is experiencing some sort of cognitive decline. This is a great uh, first question, Ellis, because this is one of the things that, um, that a lot of our patients who come to our memory clinic is saying like, I'm having this for years uh, and I didn't tell anyone, not even my own doctor, right? Because they're afraid. They're afraid of diagnosis. They're afraid that people are gonna take away their car keys or, or something like that. But doing that really is not a good thing because having a memory problem exposes you to risks of taking the wrong medication, missing an appointment, getting lost, uh, you know, uh, home safety. So it's important to tell your primary care physician or health provider that you are uh, having con uh, concerns about your own memory and thinking or a loved one like a parent, right? Mm -hmm. Because a lot of time the person, him or herself may not be aware of what they're forgetting. In fact, some of my patients get defensive, like, oh, I only remember what I want to remember. That's why I can't remember, you know, things. Uh, or they say, oh, I just didn't hear you the first time. That's why I'm repeating, I repeated the question three times. So those are things that uh, people can say, but if you're concerned, always uh, tell the healthcare provider because they are the ones who are in the most, in the best position to test whether there's something to be of concern or not. And I wanna show something on the next slide, something called the AD8. AD8 uh, stands for Alzheimer's disease eight. This is just eight simple yes or no questions that will, um, be, you will be able to take at home uh, yourself, for yourself or a loved one. And if you score two or more, then it's something that you should talk to your doctor about because there might be a concern. Again, it doesn't mean that you have Alzheimer's or you have a memory problem, but it's just something to be concerned about. I won't go over this because you can read it. You can also Google it and it's uh, freely available uh, uh, on the internet. But you know, thinking, uh, you know, it asks whether in the past several years there have been a change in any of these things like your judgment hobbies activities uh did this a person repeat questions or stories 
uh, have a problem uh, operating tools or gadgets. Again, we're asking for a change. If someone never operated uh, a VCR, then we don't expect them to be able to do that, right? But if they were able to and now they're not, that's a change uh, for getting the, the correct month or year, et cetera. So you can go over this. These are eight simple yes or no questions. And if you score two or more, it's really something that you should talk to your doctor about uh, and uh, having have them do formal testing. So in, in looking at this, I'm, I'm saying, OK, um, yeah, my father's probably scoring uh, a couple of these. And so I probably should have a more extensive uh, console. It sounds like I should have a more extensive console for him. Yeah, so this is just a screening. It's not diagnostic. It could right. be that uh, you know it's just normal aging, but it is a marker that that you should tell the primary doctor, hey, you know, I, I did the AD8 at home and it was positive. Could you uh, please uh, test my father's memory just to make sure that uh, we're not dealing with something uh, that's more serious? And he or she might do another test to see if there's anything going on. Uh, well, he, yeah. had, he had some of those risk factors on the last slide too, in terms of like he's in renal failure, he, you know. So he's he, there's there's some definitely some some other factors that are contributing that are building up now, and I'm like, maybe we need to have a more extensive uh, cognitive testing done. Sure, sure. And the way you you say it, whether for yourself or for your doctor, is really to write it down to make sure that you don't forget and that you don't hesitate saying, you know, these are things that I've observed, doctor. You know, if you the more concrete you are. The more the doctor or the nurse practitioner or the provider will be able to help you decipher whether this is something of concern or not. If you just say, "Oh, he's getting forgetful," okay, tell me more. You know, what is he forgetting? Right. So be as specific as possible. Right. Like he forgot to show up for a dinner, or he misplaced his wallet three times in the past week. You know, something as specific as that as that uh, will help your your provider. You're saying it's September when it's really October. Yeah, well, that's uh, interesting because, um, you know, sometimes that is uh, normal because some people are forgetting that the, the, the season changed. So, again, that's in and of itself, that's not necessarily abnormal, but it's certainly a cause of concern uh, if they're getting disoriented that way. Like, for example, if they say, you know, it's uh, Monday instead of Tuesday, well, maybe they're just, you know, uh, but if they say it's 2020 or 2019, when we know it's 2022, then that's more of a concern than uh, the day of the week, for example. Gotcha. All right, let's uh, go on to the next question. So this is a question that just people are asking right now in the chat room. What are the most common symptoms experienced at the beginning of Alzheimer's or dementia? And I, I know there are some questions about uh, trying to decipher the difference between Alzheimer's and, and dementia. So, because we know that Alzheimer's is a type of dementia, if I'm right, correct about that. So we, we do have to get that distinction, but what are some of the most common symptoms experienced? That's right. You've been listening to our, our, uh, our, our series, Alice. So yes, indeed. Dementia is the umbrella term that we use for these uh, neurologic conditions wherein uh, someone loses uh, some of their or their ability to perform certain cognitive things like remembering, paying attention, planning, sequencing. So dementia is the umbrella term. And then Alzheimer's is a type of dementia. So as uh, someone say, uh, all, all Alzheimer's is dementia, not all dementia is Alzheimer. Exactly. Because there are other forms of Alzheimer's disease like vascular dementia, Lewy body dementia, uh, frontotemporal dementia. So there are many different types of, of dementia, but the reason why sometimes people uh, uh, interchange these terms is because Alzheimer's is in fact the most common form of dementia. Right. Um, without, that, without, uh, with that out of the way, I want to answer the question that Alice, Alice posted. What are the most common symptoms experienced at the beginning of Alzheimer's? So if you say Alzheimer's, the answer would be memory, right? Because in Alzheimer's, memory is the most the, the 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 most the first symptom is someone's getting forgetful, right? There and it's mostly short-term memory, um, memory of things that happened in the recent past. You know, perhaps in the past day, past hour, you know, etc. Not things that happened, you know, 10, 20 years ago, because those are long-term memory, and they tend to be resistant to the early effects of Alzheimer's disease. So just because they can remember things that happened 20, 10, 20 years ago, doesn't mean that their, perf their memory is perfect. Right. Okay? It's just a different pattern. Now, if, when you talk about dementia, like again, as I mentioned, dementia is a, is a blanket term 
uh, and Alzheimer's is a part is a is a type of dementia. For Alzheimer's, memory is the short term memory is the one that's most uh, uh, affected early. But for other forms of dementia, like for example, um, 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 frontotemporal dementia or FTD. Uh, it's, a, it's a different type of dementia. It's not Alzheimer's disease. But for those patients, what's first affected is personality uh, mm -hmm. or behaviors. So you can have someone come to clinic saying, oh, you know, my mom is hugging strangers or they're being mean or they're, they're cursing, you know, when they used to be very polite and very kind. So that's a personality change. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is the one that people uh, for, with frontotemporal dementia tend to present with, and not so much the memory itself. Although memory is, is also affected, that's not the most troublesome symptom or the symptom that they come to the doctor's clinic for. So the answer to this question, the most common symptoms, it really depends on the type of dementia. That's why it's important to get an evaluation because different dementias can present differently and a memory expert can distinguish between the different types of dementia and the treatments are different as well. Um, I do want to show this slide from the uh, Alzheimer's International about the most common warning signs of dementia, because I think this is partly related to the question that was asked. How do you know that someone's having dementia? What are the symptoms? Memory loss, as we talked about, most, mostly short-term memory before long-term memory. Long-term memory tends to be intact until the later stages. Difficulty performing familiar tasks. So again, if someone has ne have never balanced a checkbook or never operated a VCR or never cooked and they're not able to now, it doesn't mean that there's something wrong with them. They just don't know how to do it. But if they used to balance their checkbook, do their own taxes, cook, uh, shop, drive, and suddenly they're not able to do that, then that's a problem, right, that you should uh, 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 look into. Problems with language, like, uh, you know, word finding difficulty and you know, stopping mid-sentence, not remembering the term that they used to, you know, what, what they want to say. So that could be a sign of a early language problem or aphasia that can, can be a sign of uh, another type of uh, dementia. Disorientation to time and place, as Alice mentioned, perhaps not knowing, you know, a Monday or Tuesday is okay, but if they don't know the year or where they are, they think that their, their home is a hotel or, um, or somebody else's home, that's disorientation that needs to be looked at. Uh, poor or decreased judgment. I have some patients who, for example, suddenly start donating to charities. Donating to charities is a wonderful thing, but if they never donated it for a charity in their whole life, and then suddenly they spent, you know, a thousand dollars donating to charities, that'd be like, okay, so what is this uh, going on? Some people do online gambling suddenly, or give strangers money, uh, etc. So those things are poor or decreased judgment that, that needs to be looked at. Problems keeping track of things uh, like their their um, bills, for example. If there are any signs of uh, missed payments, but even double payments, because some people don't remember that they already paid a bill, so they double or triple paid it. Uh, that could be a sign that they're keeping having a problem keeping track of things. Misplacing things. We all misplace things now and again. But if this is the third or fourth time this week that they misplaced their phone or their or their keys or their glasses and it's happening more frequently uh, or God forbid they put their key in the refrigerator or something like that, then I think that's something worth looking into. Changes in mood and behavior. Again, are we dealing with depression? Or are we dealing with some sort of dementia that's not diagnosed? Uh, changes in their uh, visual and spatial information. So. Uh, driving is a is a task that requires a lot of visual and spatial information. Um, you know, a lot of my patients say, "Oh, yeah, my father is safe to drive." But when I ask them, "Would you let your children uh, drive with your father, or would would you let your children um, uh, <laughs> would you let your father take your children to school?" It'd be like, "Oh, no, no way." You know, so that for me is a sign that there might be a problem with driving, right? right. Uh, so it's something that uh, we looked at, and then finally withdrawing from work or social activities. It could be because of depression. It could be because they can't hear or see anymore, but it could be also that they're having an early signs of dementia and they're embarrassed when the small talk happens, like, oh, how about them Lakers, huh? Or uh, did, your stand, your, did, your, um, did your grandson get into Emory? And you know, suddenly they don't remember uh, that's embarrassing, right? Uh, so anyway, so those are kind of things that make people withdraw from social 
activities because either they can't follow the game anymore if they're playing cards and they they remember the rules or it's taking them a long time to to add up the numbers and blackjack for example then uh then they start with drawing so again these are just rough early signs that you should look for that's fantastic next question ellis Okay, so what role do, do the social determinants of health, like poverty, lower education, poor nutrition, et cetera, play in the development of Alzheimer's? And I know that, that many people of our audience are, are impacted by the social determinants. And so what role do those things play in the development of Alzheimer's? Excellent, excellent question. Um, I thought that we should define social determinants kind of more formally. So okay. social determinants of health as defined here are conditions in which we are born, in which we grow up and age, in which we live and work, right? It's basically how we live, you know, how we grow up, how we live. And this definitely have a, a, a very strong impact in our health and well-being. So it goes from childhood experience. It's how we grew up, right? We have a healthy childhood, we have a nurturing environment. Even Ellis, it starts from the womb, you know, did our mother have a good uh, pregnancy, right? Did she get good prenatal care? Uh, housing, you know, are we, uh, as you know, a lot of our fellow Americans are, are challenged by, by housing. Is mm -hmm. that a factor um, or at risk of losing housing even if we have our own homes? Um, and then uh, education, uh, social support, uh, income, employment, communities, all of these seem to be like, it's not really health, these are life issues. But guess what? They are so intertwined to our health and well-being. Right. That's why the question is so good to ask, how is the social determinants of health impact our ability or to keep our brain healthy as we get older? And in fact, it is in, uh, uh, related. I, I will show you another slide. So if you look at our lifespan, right, from our, you know, our, uh, uh, as you were children to growth and development, as you reach middle age to our later years, we're continuing to evolve and develop, right? We don't stop developing at an age. We develop until the end, right? We change. Um, and, you know, for, for, for younger people, it's really neurodevelopment, right? They're building new brain cells. The brain cells are making new connections. It's an active phase of building uh, the, the brain and, and making it optimized. Um, and, and that's so dependent on the social environment that they have a uh, social environment that's stimulating uh, or stifling, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, are they exposed to environmental uh, uh, agents that are har harmful to them, right? Uh, you know, child abuse, for example, is a very harmful uh, to, to growth and development. Uh, genetics, we're born with this, right? How does that affect our growth and development? Nutrition, very, very important for children to have good nutrition because that supports the growth of their brains and the, and the nerves. Uh, as you go into middle age, um, vascular risk factors, you, when did you develop diabetes? Did you become obese? Did you uh, stop exercising? You started, you started smoking or alcohol? Uh, you know, that will lower our brain resistance and resilience and our reserve and uh, makes us uh, in more, more, uh, defenseless against the ravages of time, so to speak. And then finally, as we get older in our later years, how's our diet? Do we, are we still exercising? Uh, how's our blood pressure, cholesterol? So you can see it's a life course thing, right? Mm -hmm. that, uh, and then on the bottom here, it shows you the wider determinants, the socioeconomic status, because guess what? Whether your environment is, is nurturing uh, or stifling uh, nutrition, you know, vascular risk factors, all of that is tied to your socioeconomic status, the environment, uh, access to healthy foods, access to health care, access to housing uh, and medical care. So all of these are, are all related and, and it has a profound impact on brain health uh, and our risk for, for common things like stroke and dementia. Um, in fact, as you mentioned, um, our, our, a lot of our viewers are vulnerable because we know from statistics that African Americans, Latinos are more likely to have uh, some of the things that can impact our brain health adversely, like stroke, uh, heart disease, diabetes, obesity, right? And in fact, it's not surprising that African Americans as a whole are more likely to develop Alzheimer's disease about twice as much as 
as non-African Americans and Latinos one and a half times as much because all of these risk factors affect them more profoundly and they're more vulnerable to it because of health disparity. So this is a society we really need to address uh, in order to uh, to make sure that we promote brain health on in all Americans. Everyone uh, uh, of us are um, are able to reduce our risk for developing this terrible disease. Mm. Oh, okay. That's yeah, fantastic. These are some great questions, guys. I mean, when I was going through the, I was literally like, wow, that's a really good question. How did we miss that? But no, I'm glad we're, we're, we're taking this opportunity. If you're just joining us, we are talking to Dr. Tan uh, from Cedar sinai Hospital, and we're, this is about Ask the Expert. So I, I see some questions in, in the comments. We, hopefully we can get to some of those as well, because there's some good ones coming in. Um, but we are going through questions from the previous shows, and we're asking them today about Alzheimer's and, and dementia. We understand that we're using those terms interchangeably, but they're not. Dementia is the umbrella, and Alzheimer's is a form of dementia, So, but it's the most common form, which is why those terms tend to get used interchangeably. So our next question is, can Alzheimer's or dementia present symptoms similar to a mental illness for example, like talking to themselves or past relatives. And that was something that was a theme that played out multiple times in multiple questions about them talking to themselves or past relatives, even though they weren't in the room. Yeah, again, another very good question because this is a common one. Uh, and the answer is yes, but typically this happens in sort of the later stages of Alzheimer's disease. So usually it's not the first thing that shows up. Um, uh, so perhaps there were early signs or symptoms for Alzheimer's that were missed or were not so evident. Uh, and so when someone says, you know, I saw your, I was talking to your grandpa about the, about the, you know, uh, the about Christmas. It's like, grandma, what are you talking about? Grandma's grandpa's been dead for a while. It's like, what are you talking about? I just talked to him yesterday. Uh, in fact, we talked about this. So that may be because grandma may be having already signs of dementia uh, that was missed earlier, and maybe she's kind of in you know a more advanced stage. So uh, the answer is yes. Uh, so certain people with Alzheimer's or other forms of dementia can have uh, what we call hallucinations, which is seeing things that aren't there, or delusions, which are false beliefs. So delusions uh, and hallucinations are both troubling, but they're not always um, uh, a, a troubling to the individual. They will be talking about it like it's normal. It's like, oh yeah, well, how did you spend your morning, uh, mom? Oh, you know, I played with some children who were here. It's like, what children? You live mm -hmm. alone. All oh, these nice girls from the, the school next door, they were here. And, you know, so whenever you, you hear that, it's like, okay, that's impossible. Don't dismiss that. Uh, talk to the, your primary doctor because that could be a sign that they already have dementia or some other illness. Again, dementia is not the only uh, thing that can present that, that way, but it is a sign of a problem that needs to be addressed. Uh, delusions, uh, sometimes delusions can even take the form of paranoia, right? Like my cleaner stole from me. And it's like, no, you've had her for 20 years and nothing's lost, you know? So anyway. Ellis, you have a follow-up question about that. Yeah, just just um, if that if those things present and they don't have a history of mental illness, should they? Um, I'm just trying to get people. Where should they go first? Should they go to just their primary care physician? Should they take them to a psychiatric consult, or should they go to straight to a neurologist? That's a good question. Uh, my 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 suggestion is go to the primary care doctor first, okay. because sometimes these things are caused by medical issues. Like uh, you know, for older people, sometimes even a urinary tract infection can tip them uh, into what we call delirium, right? Mm -hmm. It may not be dementia. It may not be psychosis or psychiatric illness. It could be just they're having a delirium associated with, with a, a medical illness. So make sure you rule out medical conditions first, like an electrolyte abnormality, kidney failure, um, mm -hmm. and, you know, urinary tract infection. And if that's ruled out, then uh, the, the primary doctor can make an appropriate referral to either uh, a neurologist, a geriatrician, or a psychiatrist, depending on the on the situation. Gotcha. Um, I do want to show uh, this particular slide. Uh, I'm not going to go through this because this is a little bit more technical. But um, uh, on here, uh, I hope I think you're seeing my uh, arrow here. 
on the right hand side, psychosis. What this is a term that we call what we just described, hallucinations, delusions. Psychosis in, in Alzheimer's disease can take the form of hallucinations, seeing things that aren't there, delusions, which are false beliefs. Someone's stealing from me, someone wants to poison me, or someone's out to make me, uh, give me harm or make uh, do, some, do me harm, uh, or misinterpretations of certain things. So that can occur. And typically that happens because in Alzheimer's disease and their forms of dementia, because you do have the neurodegeneration, you lose brain cells, you lose the connections between brain cells, that there's a disruption in the circuitry of the brain and, um, and, and, uh, and it results in psychosis. But note, I just wanna point this out, this circular circle here, it can be exacerbated by certain things that we can control as caregivers, as providers. So okay. patient factors, like if they're in pain, if they can't see or hear uh, properly because they don't have their glasses or their hearing aids, uh, if they have unmet needs, like they're hun hungry or or they're, they're afraid because they watch that um, you know scary movie, especially now it's almost Halloween, there's a lot of scary movies in, in TV, that can trigger these psychoses. So make sure you, you protect them from these triggering things. Uh, environmental factors here on the right, like um, uh, if they're bored, then they're going to start filling things with things like I spoke to your grandpa, maybe because they have no one to talk to, right? And their mm -hmm. their minds just wander. So make sure they talk to someone, stimulate them properly. Don't overstimulate them, but also don't just leave them, you know, alone for long periods of time because then their brains will start wandering and start uh, conjuring of things that aren't real. Uh, limited life exposure. If the room is really dark and and they uh, they get confused that way because they think it's evening, but it's not. Uh, so make sure you, you you open the blinds and let them get natural light so they know what uh, day is for, for, from night. And and I reserve the best for last, which are caregiver factors, mm -hmm. right? I know caregivers are heroes. Sometimes heroes are also fallible, right? We're also imperfect as caregivers. Is there some, is there, are there things that we're doing as caregivers that are triggering these things, mm. right? Uh, unrealistic expectation, uh, communication challenges, like, like screaming at them because you're so frustrated uh, because they can't remember, uh, uh, you know, that can trigger uh, these behaviors. So again, just be mindful that, uh, the, you know, uh, the above things are explanation. These things are explanation of why psychosis happens. But the things that are under our control are circled here in orange. So make sure we we do the things that we can do to mitigate those uh, those things. Absolutely. Big one. This one. This one was repeated many, many times. How much is Alzheimer's hereditary, and what can a person do to prevent it from happening? Yeah. So this is a double double uh, question, isn't it? How much of Alzheimer's uh, hereditary? So we could tackle that. In fact, there is a question that is uh, related to that in the top ten questions. Yep. It's on, is Alzheimer's hereditary? They just asked it outright. And what can a person do to ensure that they don't get like Lewy body dementia like their parent? That was a really specific question, but I, I picked it because I think it was another way to kind of give that distinction between. Alzheimer's and another form of dementia? Yeah, excellent question again. Uh, so um, we are our genes to a certain extent, right? right? I, I always say we can't pick our parents, we can't pick our genes. We are born with certain strengths and weaknesses, positive and negative things. So we are who we are, but the but our, our genes don't define us, okay? So there are, I should say, certain diseases like Huntington's disease, uh, cystic fibrosis, uh, you know, for, pati for patients who've got the BRCA gene, the BRCA gene, which predisposes to, to uh, breast cancer or ovarian cancer. There mm -hmm. are, these are called monogenic mutations that does increase someone's risk for certain diseases uh, profoundly, right? Mm -hmm. Alzheimer's disease, at least the late form of Alzheimer's disease is not one of those diseases. There is um, a genetic component to Alzheimer's disease, but it's not 100%. So what I'm trying to say is if your parent, uh, first degree relative, whether brother, sister, mother, father uh, gets Alzheimer's disease, it doesn't mean that you're going to get it 100%. Now, for certain diseases like Huntington's disease and cystic fibrosis, once I mentioned, that are very genetic, 
uh, you know, it's different. But for Alzheimer's disease, your genes don't define you 100%. Does it increase your risk? Yes. For getting it yourself? Yes. But does it make, does it, um, uh, for sure, you should start planning because you're going to get it eventually? No, right? Because it's a combination of genetics and environment or life exposures. And that's true for heart disease. That's true for cancer. That's true for, for stroke. Um, we have to know what our family history is for diseases because we need to know what our genetic predispositions are and fight it. Fight it like, uh, like we want to make sure that we don't get it, right? Whatever we can do. And that's why programs like this is so important because information is where it begins of how to fight our, or tip the odds in our favor, I should say. Uh, Lewy body um, um, also has a genetic component. It's less than Alzheimer's disease. So even more, even less of a, of a, of a genetics. For, for Alzheimer's disease though, we do know more about the hereditary, the, uh, the herit heritability of it. So this, um, this graphic shows us uh, on the left side here, the Alzheimer's disease risk factor. Genetic, as they say, again, this is um, not perfect, but this is based on what we know so far. Genetic factors are responsible for 58 to 79% of our risk for developing Alzheimer's disease, okay? So, but 35% or even more is modifiable or environmental, right? So you can see how if we affect this yellow part, modifiable factor, we may not get Alzheimer's disease at all, even though we have certain risks for developing Alzheimer's disease. In terms of genetics, I just want to mention that it's not a simple test. So if you get 23andMe or Ancestry, you know, they tell you, you are increased risk for Alzheimer's disease. That's based on only this gene, the APOE4 gene, right? One gene. That's only 5 to 9% of the genetic risk. So don't read too much into those uh, commercial genetic tests that tells you whether you're at risk for developing Alzheimer's disease or not. Just know that a lot of studies are going on, including here at Cedar sinai where we're trying to develop uh, systems to, to measure and to determine what are the complete genetic uh, risks uh, that we can tell whether someone's going to get dementia or not, to define this 58 to 79% risk. A lot of them are still unknown, in fact. Uh, and every day we're getting better at predicting this, but just know the genetics uh, are only define part of your risk. A lot of risk is environmental and modifiable. So that's what's empowering about this. Uh, and eventually there might be a future where we could say, you know, this is your genetic risk and we know all of this green part. Let's work on this yellow part, right? Because we can't change our genes. And, um, and uh, you know, again, another way to think about this is this APOE. You always hear about APOE as a genetic risk. Uh, APOE2, uh, there's three forms, APOE2, APOE3, and APOE4. People in AP with APOE4, especially those who have two copies of it, are at greater risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. Okay. APOE2 decreases the risk, but most people have an APOE3 form. But remember, this is only like five, nine percent or so of the risk, right? So don't go start running and getting your APOE. E. It's not, in fact, it's not recommended because even if you have APOE E four, it doesn't not mean that you're going to get Alzheimer's disease. We have people who have double APOE E four who don't have Alzheimer's, and we have people who don't have any APOE E four who have Alzheimer's disease. So clearly, it's not just our genes, right? It's our exposures. It's the totality of things. <laughs> And that gets me to the second part of that question, Ellis. How does one prevent uh, Alzheimer's disease? And you've seen this graphic before if you saw our first uh, talk in the series uh, here at Cedars. We're making it simple for uh, patients to remember what are the things that they can do to prevent uh, or reduce their risk of developing dementia and this in mnemonic brains, blood pressure control, uh, uh, adequate rest and sleep. Mm -hmm. activity, not just physical, not just exercise, but also remaining socially active, right? Make friends, uh, be, be part of your community, uh, intellectual stimulation, even uh, in our later years, uh, good nutrition and adequate nutrition. And then finally, uh, staying away from uh, the bad for the brain, smoking, alcohol, and pollution. 
Uh, and I, as I mentioned before, uh, normal blood pressure is less than 120 over 80. Um, and so work with your doctor about that, about this. Not everyone can have a blood pressure less than 120 over 80. In fact, for some people, they not, do not tolerate this level of blood pressure. So, but just know that uh, if you have elevated blood pressure, especially if it's 140 uh, or over 90 or higher, uh, you should definitely get uh, that treated because that increases your risk, not just for, uh, not just increase your risk for stroke and Alzheimer's disease, but also for heart heart attacks, right? And other bad things. And just to show you what happens to the brain, if you leave it with elevated blood pressure, it develops these white matter hyperintensities, they call it. These are wear and tear, right? These white things shouldn't be there. Uh, it's there because of lifelong, these spots right here shouldn't be there because it's because of someone lets blood pressure linger, high blood pressure linger, high cholesterol linger without treatment. That's what you get in your brain, and that it reflects to forgetfulness and and uh, you know uh, inability to maintain your brain health. Uh, again, the aging brain needs exercise. Uh, and exercise um, has been shown to improve the function of your brain. In fact, uh, your your brain cells are are happier when you exercise. You get good blood flow. Uh, they're more efficient, just like you know, uh, anything, it's like cars or machines or anything like that. If you practice it, if you, if you maintain it, it, it works better. Um, and then the other thing, as I mentioned, is sleep. Uh, sleep is so important uh, in our busy lives. Uh, no matter how busy we are, we have to make sure that we get restful sleep, ideally about seven hours or so per night if we are able, uh, because a lot of things happen in our sleep, our brain, it's almost like cleaning up our brains from all that toxic, uh, you know, uh, metabolites that have accumulated during the day when we're so busy running around, uh, working, uh, you know, uh, socializing. So sleep is so important. Just the diet, as I mentioned, um, favor healthy things like whole grains, vegetables, fruits, uh, lean meats, nuts, um, uh, and less of the sweets and, uh, red meat. So again, uh, um, I think you, if you could follow good um, diet, I think that that is also good for your brain. And as I mentioned, smokers are more likely to get dementia. So stay away from smoke, uh, even secondhand smoke. It increases your risk, not just for heart disease, stroke, diabetes, lung cancer, also for dementia. So again, there's a lot of benefits for that. Alcohol, this one, I, I think I showed you before, um, uh, on the upper part here are, is a normal, um, brain of a normal elderly person and uh, in the bottom are uh, brains of someone who's been exposed to uh, chronic alcoholism. Mm. Uh, it's real alcoholism. Alcohol is bad uh, for a lot of reasons. So if you do drink, drink uh, uh, minimally. Uh, yeah. But if you don't drink, don't start now because uh, <laughs> it's probably not good for you. And just to give you an idea, and my patient asked me, okay, so what's too much? What's uh, what's moderate? Well, this is, um, this is how usually it's defined. Uh, but again, talk to your doctor about it. Everyone's different, um, but uh, it's important. Okay, I think those were uh, the main questions I had. Uh, one thing that I would, uh, and the last slide, and then maybe we can have a conversation for the last uh, few minutes, uh, is that um, there's a lot of misconceptions about aging, cognitive aging, right? Um, and it's more than memory. Cognition is more than memory because some people may have good memory, but they can't pay attention or they're not able to plan or sequence things. So memory is important. Don't get me wrong, but don't think that memory equals dementia. Uh, it affects other things too, like problem solving, attention. Uh, like for when you're driving, for example, right? You're not just relying on memory. You have to pay attention. You have to be able to react, right? Yeah. You have to be able to plan when to turn on your signal light and, uh, and turn properly. Uh, and then other things that aging can have both positive and negative effects on cognition. As we get older, we get wiser. Uh, um, you, you hear about a lot of young people who have mental health issues. It's because they haven't lived a full life yet, right? They haven't been exposed to sort of the challenges that we've all gone through. Uh, so being older does mean that you've been a survivor right? Especially after this couple of years, we're all survivors, right? If we, we get it through this, we're all survivors. So we, that makes us more resilient. So that's one positive aspect of aging is that you do become more resilient. Um, 
of, um, of challenges. Um, it's a misconception that we can't do anything to improve our cognitive health. We just went over many things that we can do to improve our cognitive health, right? There's definitely, remember that brain's mnemonic. Um, and then finally, uh, that we lose brain cells as we get older. It's not true. You know, usually we keep the brain cells. Uh, they may not be functioning like a 20 year old, but we still have them, right? We just have to, um, uh, maximize or make do with what we have and uh, and then we'll be fine okay that is the last slide so I will uh, stop sharing and then maybe we can have a conversation for the rest and of that, that was that was fantastic I want to say uh, thank you to all the the questions that people submitted uh, there were some there's some questions today that, that that were that were answered um, with this presentation so that that is uh, fantastic um, I do want to stress as, as, as we're wrapping up here, I do want to stress uh, control what you can control, right? You know, that's something that if you play sports, my football coach used to, you know, yell it to us, control what you can control. What you can control is how much you, what you eat, what you put in your body. What you can control is how much you exercise, um, how much you drink if you're drinking, if you're smoking, you can stop smoking. If you're obese, you can start working on losing weight. So there's some things that, that you have more control over the development of dementia or Alzheimer's than you think you do, right? And so those you can't control the genetics, some environmental factors you can't control, but control what you can. Um, and, and that'll go a long way in towards, a, in, in towards having a healthy um, you know, brain functioning as we age. And I just want to say, uh, again, uh, Dr. Tan, thank you. That, that was a fantastic presentation. Very easy to understand and easy to follow. So um, just just wonderful, wonderful job. Thank you so much. It's always a pleasure and an honor to be uh, with you, Ellis. Um, I hope uh, this is helpful to viewers out there. And uh, make sure you tune in to, tune in to the other uh, brain health uh, series that you have coming up, which I'm sure you'll tell people about. Oh, absolutely. We're going to be promoting that uh, here. And then um, also we're going to re-air this tomorrow morning. So if you missed any part of it or if you have a friend that you need to watch this, it's, we're going to re-air this tomorrow morning so people can get a chance to get this. And it'll also be on our Facebook page and our YouTube channel. So uh, check check us out. Uh, we're here. It's all about you know brain health and a healthy aging brain. Uh, thank you all for joining us and we will see you uh, next time.